Hi there, welcome to the blacksmith shop here at the museum. Uh, we have a fairly large, fairly well equipped uh, blacksmith shop for uh, myself or whoever else is the resident to work in. Um, we do a mixture of our own personal sculptural work and commission work for clients in the museum, uh, which is mostly more sculptural work or sometimes a lot of architectural work as well. Uh, so throughout a lot of history, blacksmiths uh, primarily were making some combination of either tools for other trades or you know, artistic and sort of uh, architectural things for people's houses. Uh, and that's still broadly true today. Um, a lot of blacksmiths still make tools for other tradesmen and a lot of blacksmiths make a lot of uh, very fancy sculptural pieces or uh, really wonderful architectural work for people's houses, whether that's smaller work like tables uh, and you know, individual smaller pieces or much larger pieces like driveway gates and chandeliers and things like that. Uh, for a little demonstration today, I'm going to make a little coat hook like this. Um, sort of the standard one that we make, it has a little demonstration piece. Um, yeah, it shows a good variety of different techniques that we use here. Uh, so I'm going to start with putting a bar into my pot, into my fire here. Uh, so this is my, this is my forge. Uh, it's essentially a big steel table with a cast iron bowl in it. And that cast iron bowl contains my fire. Uh, and I have a blower over here that will blow air up through the bottom of that bowl. Uh, and that's how you control how thoroughly your fire is burning, how hot it is, how cool it is, um, with this little lever right here, which lets more or less air into the fire. So, so the first thing I'm going to do when I pull that out is I'm going to start by making what is going to eventually become this little pig pigtail scroll right here, this little swirl at the end. That makes it look a little bit nicer, it keeps it from grabbing onto your jacket or anything. Okay. So I'm gonna start here on the horn of my anvil. And by working just at the very tip of my piece, I can make a nice, sharp little point. So you can see that point is not nearly long enough and not nearly thin enough yet. So I'm gonna get it back in the fire, get a little bit more heat, and I'm gonna stretch this material out, what we call drawing material out, to make it longer and thinner. And what drawing it out is gonna do is gonna make it so that when I go to bend that curve, it's going to bend a little bit more gracefully. Uh, it's going to look a little bit nicer. So the middle of my fire, when it's burning properly, burns at about 2,700 to 3,000 degrees, give or take. Uh, so that's only when it's burning really fully. You can make it be a little bit softer. The steel will actually start to burn at the fire. So you have to be very careful with how long you leave the piece in the fire. So you'll pull it out and there'll just be a big firecracker on the end of it. And you won't have anything that you can actually work with because it'll be all, all be gone. So I've stretched that out a little bit more, made it a little bit longer, a little bit skinnier. But you can kind of see it's still all lumpy and square. The first thing I'm going to do is make it a little bit less lumpy by so coming here onto the face of my head. So every part of an anvil has its own set of different jobs. Every part that is different from the other parts is a different tool for doing different things. Um, the horn is great for making circles and for stretching things out a little bit more aggressively because of this curve on it. Whereas the face, which is this flat part in the middle, helps me make things nice and smooth and continuous and flat um, because it's got a flat surface to work from. Likewise, the heel of my anvil is good for doing other kinds of bends and any other tools that I want can actually be added to it with this square hole, for example. So the next thing I'm gonna do is take that section that I've drawn out 
and smooth that. And I'm going to change it from being square to being round. So, something that's square has four sides, an octagon has eight sides, uh, a decaheptagon, I think, has 16 sides. Something that's truly round only has one side, but that's a lot more work than I feel like putting into this. So instead, I'm just going to make it have a whole lot of sides, and it'll look round to the human eye. So I'm going to start by going from four to eight sides. And then I'm going to just sort of roll my piece continuously, trying to find any little corners that need to get blended back together. Now I have something that's about four-ish inches long, tapers very nicely to a point, and is nice and round. So that gives me just enough material to make that hook and scroll on the end of it. So you guys might notice that I'm holding on to the end of the bar. Steel is actually not a really good conductor of heat, but right about now it's starting to get a little warm. So what I'm going to do is just grab it with my tongs and cool off the back end of it so I can keep pulling on. So, thus far I've been using my horn and the face my anvil. Now I'm gonna use the edges to make those curves. Uh, essentially what we do when we are forging steel is that we're turning it into a piece of clay. We're making it so that it can be squished and squeezed into different shapes. But you always need two things about it. You need force being given to the piece and a way for that force to be resisted. When, okay. when we're forging in the anvil, that force and that resistance are right across each other and that's what causes it to squish and squeeze into different shapes. If I want to bend it, all I need is some gap between where that force is being given and how that force is being resisted. So you see how by working over the edge of my anvil, by having a space between those two forces on the, on the piece, I can make it bend around. And there we go. I've got a nice curve, generous enough to hang the world's biggest backpack, shallow enough that you're not gonna have to be fishing stuff out of it. It's gonna work pretty nice. So, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take about an inch and change right behind that. I'm going to give it a twist around. Um, that's going to look really nice and it's just sort of going to show off another way we have to manipulate this. Another way to change the mouth. I'm going to do that here at my big old butts. Uh, so I mentioned how, you know, when we're forging the material, we're squeezing it between force given and force resisted. When we're bending it, we are making a gap between those two. When we go to twist something, we're giving force in the form of torque. And that torque is being resisted by, usually, a big vice that isn't going to be moved. So it's everything between that twist and that stability of the vice that gets affected by that twist. Whatever you, whatever shape the material is at that point, you're basically just gonna be able to look at it from all different sides, and that's what makes that cool shape on that twist. That's a little bit more.
saw how easy that was. Just spinning it around a little bit. Make sure it's still relatively straight. So the next thing I've got to do is cut this off of this longer bar. Obviously this is a lot more than I need. So I'm gonna grab this tool called a hot cut, which can sit in that party hole, and I can use it as a chisel to cut off the amount of material that I want. I have a lot of different tools like this. Need the little smaller shapes tool for making a big spoon. Um, essentially any shape that you want that your animal doesn't have in and of itself, you can make and that square hole keeps it from moving around too much. So anything that you don't need continuously, you can have ready to go while you have all the shapes that you want a lot more frequently already built into the end. Whatever else you need, you can just add and take off as you need it. So, I'm gonna give myself about an inch or so. And by pressing this bar against this wedge, I can force that wedge into the bar making it thinner and thinner down into the middle. Uh, you can see how thin that is right now. I don't really want to cut all the way through on my own, or just on here, because that makes it a lot more likely that I'm going to wind up smacking the edge on this, which might hurt my hammer or my hot cut. And if I just cut most of the way through, I can just wiggle it off like that, and I'm ready to go. Now that I'm done with that, take it off. So the next thing I've got to do, almost done, is I've got to make that little thumbprint on the back that will let this actually get attached to a wall. That means the near side of my end will be. So you might see behind me and around me a lot of different tools and different cameras and stuff and different kinds of tongs. You do a huge amount of different things in here, having different cameras and different tongs and a bunch of different tools allows us to make all the different kinds of changes we want to whatever we're working with. So. Put a little bit on my anvil. have a nice, big, round, lollipop-like shape to put a hole in. To do that hole, I've got this tool, it's called a punch, which is basically just a slightly flattened taper made of a little bit tougher steel. And that can be used to press through an inch of the material, pressing it out of the way like you know clay or Play-Doh. And that will allow me to make a hole. I'm going to start from the back. Turn it over to the front. Okay. 
よね So now, last little bit just to make sure that everything lines up nicely. And it looks good. So I can take a big brush, scrub it up. You might see all these gray flakes around here. That's a material called scale, which is a form of iron oxide, it's a form of rust. It forms on the outside of steel above a certain temperature. You gotta scrape it off if you want it with a kind of gross surface on the piece. So there's that, that's all good. Pull that off in this thing of water right here. And we're ready to go. All done. Goodbye.